to you today a little bit about persistent prayer. You know, we've uh, just recently, this past week, lost uh, Queen Elizabeth II, and I've been really encouraged to see some things. Um, you know, Franklin Graham posted some things about that his father really had a lot of respect for Queen Elizabeth II, and felt like sh that she always really encouraged him in his preaching, and felt pretty sure that she had a very strong faith in Jesus. Yes. And one of the things that people have said about her is that she did pray every single day, you know, so she was very persistent in her prayers. And Jesus also told us about a widow woman who was very persistent. And so I wanted to look at that today. So this is out of Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. And it says, One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. And if you know this in other uh, translations, it might be more familiar. Men ought always to pray and never to faint, is I think what the King James said. Um, but anyway, we are to always be praying. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? And I think this parable sometimes is puzzling for people. I know for me personally, I always used to think, why is Jesus comparing God to an unjust judge? You know, I think because we tend to think that Jesus is always comparing people when he does his parables. But really, he's making a contrast here. And he's actually saying that this guy who is not at all a godly judge, in fact, a lot of people think the reason why he didn't answer this request initially was he wanted a bribe. He was holding out, hoping that this woman would finally bring him a bribe. Uh, but finally, he was like, well, all right, I've just had enough. I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to actually answer this anyway. And so even though he didn't care about God, he didn't care about people, he still chose to answer this. So how much more will God, who does care about people and loves us, answer our prayers? I just think that's such an encouraging thing. And for us to not, not give up, to not be weary in praying or bringing things to Him. I know sometimes it can feel that way. You may, I'm sure you probably have some things in your life that you've prayed over probably for years even. Haven't necessarily seen them come to pass. I know I've got a few of those. Uh, but he wants us to be persistent in that. And I just want to encourage you, if there's been something that you've laid down, you know, something that maybe for a while you were praying about, but you finally just were like, yeah, that doesn't seem to be changing. <laughs> Forget it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, that it really is important for us to pray, because your prayer is not just important to you, it's important to God. Yeah. And I'm going to show you that through just uh, some scriptures. I'm sure there are way more scriptures on this, but here's just a few. One is that God focuses on our prayer. And Psalm 116.2 says, Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. And that word that's translated bends down uh, is a word that also means to incline or to turn towards. And so I think it's just really a picture of like Father God kind of bending down like you would maybe with a kid and, and turning your ear, you know, like he's really focusing to listen to you. You know, it, your request is important to him, important enough to him to focus on. And then uh, number two is our prayers are incense, which is really worship to God. I think that's something that we need to remember. And this is out of Revelations 5.8. And it says, And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. You know, so I just think there's something really important. I was not quite ready for that one. There's something really important about our prayers, and they're more important than the outcome. You know, which I think sometimes is what we're focused on. We're always, right. like, 
you know, well, it doesn't seem to be working, so I'm going to stop. But God is honored and worshipped by you when you pray. And then finally, God bottles our tears. I think this got mentioned yesterday at our, our citywide prayer meeting as well. I just think that's such an incredible picture. You know, this is out of Psalm 56, 8. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. You know, so all your crying over something, all your care over it, it's precious to God. Our prayers are precious to God. And I just want you to know that today. You know, so if you've been struggling a little bit with prayer, I know I go through seasons. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it can feel kind of dry. You're like, eh, I don't feel like doing this today. Um, just to picture that. I think that'll help to energize your prayers and, and make it so that you really feel like, wow, I'm coming to God and I'm worshiping Him today. And this is accomplishing something. I may not always see, you know, in the natural what it's doing, but it is doing something. And so I also wanted to encourage you, if you have a prayer request, you know, we would love to agree with you. You know, so you still have time to fill out one of those yellow cards. And we're going to receive those in just a, just a moment here. Uh, we're also going to receive the offerings. You know, and as you give, you're a part of House of Purpose being able to be here in this neighborhood, uh, shining the light of God. You know, we can't be here without you. So I just want to encourage you and thank you so much for your support of this ministry and of this church. So it, it means the world to us. And we've got a few electronic ways that you can give. These are also in your bulletin. Uh, but we're also going to receive the offering here in the service and your prayer requests. So I'm going to pray over those. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, you know, that you want to hear from us, Lord. I just think that's such an awesome idea. You're not, you know, just someone who wanted to be distant from us, but you wanted to have this incredible relationship with us. And you wanted to be so close to us, you wanted to live inside of us. I mean, I just can't even imagine that either, Lord, because uh, your ways are so much higher than our ways. That's not anything I would have even ever thought of on my own. And so I just praise you for that. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us, Lord, just to bring our burdens and our cares to you. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with every single prayer request that somebody has on their heart today, Lord. I pray, God, that you are moving in their lives, Lord. And, Lord, I pray also that you would be with the people giving, that you would provide for their needs, Lord, just like that song, Sparrows. You know, you take good care of us, Lord, so we thank you for that. And, Lord, I pray that you would use these offerings to cause more people to come into that type of relationship with you. So we thank you for that, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so Max and Amy are going to receive the offerings and your prayer requests. And while they're doing that, I have just a few announcements for us. Um, first of all, East Colfax Neighborhood Association is having a block party this afternoon, and we've been invited to it. And so this is at Verbena Park, and they're going to have some free food, um, you know, local music and entertainment. So this goes from 2 to 5. Pastor David and I plan to be there. Um, we'll probably be there at 2. I don't, we probably are not going to stay all the way till 5, but um, we wanted to just invite anybody else who would like to come. Um, so I think that'll be a great time to connect with our neighborhood. And then on Tuesday, we are doing our study, What's So Amazing About Grace? And I just thought that was such a great study this past Tuesday. Um, uh, Grace is really amazing, and we're learning that more and more. And so we have dinner uh, at 5 p.m., and then after that we do the study. And we're always done by usually by 7 p.m. So that's a great time. And then finally we have Hop Cafe, which is our Wednesday morning outreach that we do. So we're out on the street out there. We're connecting with the neighborhood. And from what I understand, we've really been having a lot of people coming by lately at that. So that is 7.30 to 9 if you can't stay for the whole thing, but you could come for some. Uh, we want to invite you to do that too. Uh, but it's just a, a great time connecting with people and showing them the love of God. And with that, I will call up Pastor David. All right. Can we thank uh, Messenger for being here today? Hallelujah. Thank yeah. you so much. We've had uh, a little bit of um, challenge with sound this morning, and I thank you for your patience with that, and also your patience, Messenger, with that. So, you know, we need grace for each other, 
in our lives. Um, but you know, we also want to know what God's purpose is. And we really, as a part of that purpose, sometimes we don't count the cost of what that's worth and what it takes as we start to move according to God's purpose. Um, today is a very significant day. It's been 21 years since 9-11. Yeah. I know in Flight 93, they had an opportunity really quickly to assess the cost in the back of that plane that crashed in Shanksville. Now that they really know that, you know, their actions would protect the Pentagon, would not the Pentagon, but the Capitol is where that plane was heading. <coughs> but did they know the exact cost? And sometimes we don't. But yet we need to act. And we need to act by faith. And um, as a part of counting that cost, we got to say, okay, so what does it mean um, then to count the cost today? What does it mean to count the cost when Jesus walked the earth? I mean, that's very key. And then what is it all worth in my life today? I have no idea sometimes what the cost will be. When I step out in ministry, me and Nancy didn't have any idea what it was going to be like or what the cost was going to be. And I'm sure there's situations in your life where, you know, you thought you had counted the cost, but you know what actually costs more. So what does the Bible have to say? What does the New Testament have to say? What did, more importantly, what did Jesus have to say about counting the cost? In Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 26, in verse 25 it says, large crowds were going along with Jesus. You know, there was a lot of people following him. Some didn't know why. Some thought, oh, isn't this guy interesting? This guy that, you know, some said, is, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Right? And you may think in your life, can any good thing come out of my particular situation today? Is anything good? Is there any fruit in my life currently? And I know I'm going through a hard time. I'm going through a difficult time. And so, you know, there's crowds going wrong, but they don't understand what it is all worth and what it is going to take and the cost that needs to be counted. And so he turned to them and he said, as Jesus said, he says some really good news to them. <laughs> if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and sisters, can you imagine the expressions on the faces? <laughs> Yes, even his, well, his own life. There's a lot of cost involved there, right? But it's in the sense of indifference or relative disregard, I like the way the Amplified puts it, in comparison to his attitude towards God. That is the key. What is the focus? Okay? So do I value my current situation, or what I perceive it to be, and I want to hang on to it so much that I don't recognize and focus on God. And when we go through difficult times, and when you go through difficult times in, in ministry, or you go di in, through difficult times in your life, it is easy to lose a certain focus on God. And in essence, you can lose hold of the purpose of which God has called you to. And maybe God has promised something very important in your life, but you haven't seen it come to pass yet, but the Lord wants you to know that it will. It's going to come to pass. Though it tarry, wait for it. Amen? So the multitudes were attracted. One thing they were attracted to was the miracles. Everybody wants a miracle in their life. Yeah. You know, when you want a miracle, you want it now, huh? It's hard to wait around for something that would be a little bit more progressive in terms of a miracle, whether it's a healing in your life or whatever that you're faced with. I know we re recently lost 
Art from Heaven Bound, he had passed away. We look at that. Art was a, a faithful person in ministry with Heaven Bound. He served, you know, at, house, at uh, Purpose Fest and many other events. And Art focused on ministry to the end until God had called him home. But the people that were around Jesus, there were different elements that were going on. Some expected the miracles. Some expected an earthly kingdom coming in the immediate future. They wanted earthly life rather than the Word of God. Rather than, let's say, the promise of God. Like his words. Sometimes it's like, I don't know if this is ever going to work out. I don't know if this is ever going to come to pass. You know what? I would settle for a miracle right now. Right? Sometimes we come up a little bit lame. <laughs> and we, we'd like a little bit of a miracle right now. John 6, 55 through 57 says, For my flesh... Jesus says is true food. He says, my blood is true drink. <laughs> Jesus had a way of shocking people. Didn't he? <laughs> uh, swallow this one, if you will. Uh, this is going to be a difficult pill for you. But anyone who eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood and remains in me and I in him, I live, then he says, because of my father because of living, my living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me. Think about what the crowds are saying. What are we got to eat this guy? What's going on here? Right? Many were offended at the saying. They didn't understand it. It wasn't what they were looking for. It wasn't what they were bought into. Okay? It did not fit their expectation. And sometimes life does not fit our expectation. Sometimes it hits you right between the eyes. Sometimes you are faced with loss. It doesn't fit in with the promise that God has spoken into your life, but yet the promise remains. And the very Word of God was before them. In 67... And then, you know, this is interesting. Let's go back. They said, who can understand this? This is a difficult saying. And sometimes God's word is difficult to swallow given the circumstance or the situation that we find ourselves in. And sometimes it's difficult to remember or hang on to even the promise of God's word in which he has spoken into your life. In 67 through 68, then Jesus turned to the 12 and he said, Are you also, are you going to leave too? He's thinking, you know, the disciples probably are gathered around him thinking, Jesus, do you think we should kind of shore this thing up, man? It's kind of falling apart, right? <laughs> do you think we should uh, fix this, uh, Lord? Can you imagine the thoughts going on? Look, we had a whole bunch of people. Now they're gone. And maybe you feel like you're all alone in this situation, in the promise that God has planted in your life. It seems like nobody's bought into it. But I want to tell you that it still remains. And you need to cling to it. You need to hang on to it. You need to consider that it is going to cost and ministry costs, right, Pastor Nancy? It certainly does. Many of you can relate. Can you raise both hands and two feet if you wouldn't fall over, please? So, Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom are we going to go? Where are we going to turn to? You have the words that give eternal life. Notice the focus now. It's not on the temporal. 
It's out of the, the eternal. So Peter, though many times he had put his foot in his mouth, yet he had the focus, the idea, right? He says, where else are we going to turn to but the promise of God? Where else are we going to turn to? You know, we left everything to follow you. This was very vivid in their minds, right? And you may have left everything. Maybe your family has turned against you. God says, don't worry. These things are going to happen. They're happening now. Doesn't mean I can't turn it around in your situation. But you need to just follow me, is what the Lord says. Your focus is not on the immediate. No, it is on the eternal. Amen? So, point number one, a true disciple is more interested in the Word of God than the miracles that prove it. Now, God confirms His Word with miracles, signs, and wonders in our life. But the primary thing is the Word of God. Right? Is it getting so engrafted in my life that I realize even though I'm faced with the cost, I'm actually understanding along the way that this is really going to cost. But yet, I can't go anywhere else. God, this is where you left me. But yet, I still believe you. Point number two, to live according to the Lord's purpose for your life, be prepared, here's some good news, to be uncomfortable. That's the way it works. That's how faith grows. My God, if we received a miracle every time we turned around, there would be no faith, right? So get prepared when you step out according to God's plan and His purpose to step out of your comfort zone, right? Put the Twinkies down. <laughs> when Jesus calls you out of your old life, it's not going to be cushy. But you know there are going to be times that you glimpse back and you say, man, God has really built my faith. When circumstances might happen. No, they will. When they happen in your life, my friends, focus on what is happening on the inside. What is God doing? What is He getting? How is He getting mileage in this area of my life? How is He stretching me? Get this. How is He preparing me for my future? Don't focus on the immediate. Be prepared to be uncomfortable, but focus on the purpose. Counting the cost of being a disciple. If you want to be my disciple, and verse uh, Luke 14, 26, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everything else. Everything. Everything in comparison to following Him. To remaining in His purpose. It may not look good, the kids could go nuts. Oh, they will. <laughs> Believe me. You know, immediately, I'll tell you what. When I preach on this message, well, somebody a lot contrary to it. I've come to expect it. Those things will happen. People will decide, is it worth it all? I'm here to tell you that it is. I'm here to tell you that, you know, in comparison, all these, it says, seek first. Matthew 6, 33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Right. See, we get it in, in reverse. We got to rush off to the, the clam bank and our family reunion rather than seek God's purpose, you know. We're seeking after the, 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 the buffet after the service rather than the service itself. You know, in comparison, though, in comparison, all these other relationships do not compare. 
to following the Lord. Now they will fall into place. The Proverbs tell us, raise up a child in the way in which he should go, and when he's older, he will not depart from it. Amen? Amen. Proud of this young man playing the keyboard here. Yeah. You're awesome, man. You are awesome. Yeah. Yay, Proof of Proverbs. Amen? And then Revelation 12, 11 says, they have defeated him. By the blood of the Lamb. And by their testimony. They, they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Oh my gosh. You know, in this time and era, have anyone ever read the Book of the Martyrs? Yeah, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Even now, persecution has increased. Over the time that that book was written, in fact, it is visiting our shores right now. Be prepared for people not to like you. Jesus says you're in good company. Guess what? They didn't like me either. And are you trying to win a popularity contest? You will lose. You will get disappointed if you are trying to win a popularity contest with all of those around you. If you're seeking human approval, you'll be disappointed. If you're seeking blessing just in the immediate future, you may be disappointed. But know that following Jesus Christ, it requires loyalty to Him above any earthly relationship any okay I'm here to make you happy today I hope you show up next Sunday <laughs> if you do you're well on the way to your purpose amen <laughs> understand that discipleship means submitting self-interest to the kingdom what do they yell today what about our democracy? Folks are saying a democracy right. is a kingdom. And there is a king, right? There's a king that we follow. And so the king says this in Matthew 14, 27. And if you don't carry your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Oh, we had, oh, folks, we had fun carrying the cross down East Colfax. <laughs> Loads of fun. The cross was about 75, 80 pounds. But when you began to carry it, it was a 10-foot cross that we carried for years. And not many would pick it up and carry it. They'd think, well, here's four or five guys that are carry it, but the ones that were carrying it, they were getting blessed. I remember one time I was carrying it down Colfax, and there was a what you would might call a dog and pony show of the city council and the governor, and not the governor, but the you know the mayor's office and all them as they're getting ready to redo Colfax. You can see the building that's starting to take place on Trenton Street and where the strip club was torn down. Well, that strip club got torn down because there was a 10-foot cross playing in front of that, you know, of God's people praying in front of that strip club. God made a mountain level wow. that doesn't exist anymore. We used to take that cross and do a service in the back of that, in the field behind that strip club. We were all around that place. Actually, the owners came out and gave us water one time, and we prayed with them. <laughs> There's nothing like serving God. So one time I'm carrying the cross down Colfax. I forget. Listen, what's great about serving Jesus is he says, take upon my burden, it's light. I got the rest. So we're carrying this cross down Colfax into the middle of a dog and pony show. I didn't even know what was happening. You know, the lieutenant uh, uh, mayor or whoever they were, they're all out there, the city council, and I'm walking down the street, 
And I'm shaking her hands. Hey, how you doing? I'm forgetting like this cross is up here. It's different than taking the plank out of your own eye. No, you're seeing clearly. All right. You're carrying this cross, okay? And, and they're, they're, you're shaking hands with them. And I'm, I forget the cross is there. And then pretty soon we set it down. We begin to pray uh, close to where the liquor store is at in front of another house of ever repute that is called Pleasures. And we put this, the, the cross down in front of that, and we begin to pray. We forget about the dog and pony show. That's all over. We all shook hands. We're good. We're about ministry now. We set the cross down. Pretty soon, these guys pull up in this car, and they said, this is too much. They were some gang members, and they were going to seek retribution for someone that had killed one of their friends. And they come up to the cross, and they're crying. And, and, and they said, we're going to this liquor store to get drunk and all lit up so that, um, you know, we could carry out this, this, this little mission that we have in our own mind. They're considering the counting the cost in a strange kind of way, I guess. They don't realize the fact that they could go to prison or die before they went to prison or whatever. I don't know that they could, you, you really think of those things when you're under the influence, not at all, actually. So they're trying to summon up some courage to do what they plan on doing anyway. And they come and they start crying and they're still at the cross and pretty soon the dog and pony show gathers around and begins to witness this whole thing. And pretty soon they're crying and they're carrying on and there's just tears running and these guys are giving their life to the Lord. Instead of going to prison. That is the treasured and blessed times that you remember when you trust in God. And you pick up the cross and you carry it. And you say, you know what? I know what's going to cost me. I know that sometimes it's going to be a struggle. And I know sometimes it may seem like I'm doing it of my own effort, but I don't have to because, you know, Greater is he that lives in me than he that's in the world. See, there's the Holy Spirit living inside. And so few people are ready to pick up and do some things that they're called to do. And I want to thank Amy for doing the study on Tuesday night. She stepped up and did the study on Tuesday night of grace. Thank you so much. And miracles are going to happen as a result of that. So carrying the cross. Whoops. Or the microphone, one of the two. <laughs> that could cause a bad hair day. <laughs> but it continues in verse 28. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who could begin the construction of a building? without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough, enough money to finish it. Otherwise, you might complete the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you, and they would say, there is a person who started a building that couldn't afford to finish it. Proverbs 24, 27 says this, Do your planning. Prepare your fields before you build your building. We watch this episode once in a while called Clarkson Farms, and this guy seems ill-prepared. He just decides to plant some, pump, some pumpkins in a dry field, and he says, well, now I'm going to take the tractor down to the water, and he has to go through the trees, and he says, I guess to get water, you've got to break a few branches. And so there's no planning whatsoever involved in this situation. And somehow he's wondering why. Then it turns out so crazy. He says, why do I have all these problems? And sometimes, you know, we put the cart before the horse. Sometimes we put our left foot out in front of our right foot and wonder why we trip over the other one. But then in Luke 14, 31 through 33, it says, or would a king go to war against another king for, uh, without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss, you know, I have this army of 10,000. Could it defeat 20,000 soldiers marching against him? Or does he just run out with his 10,000 soldiers and attack 20,000? 
That would be foolish. If he can't, he will sell it, send a delegation and discuss the terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything you own. Sometimes it seems like it isn't going to add up, right? God's math usually doesn't until you get to the place where you realize that's what it's all about. But still, there's a personal inventory that takes place inside. It says, yes, I'm willing to follow you, Jesus. I'm not just looking for the miracles. I'm not just looking for the blessing. Being Jesus' disciple requires a total commitment, right? It requires a total focus on what's important in this present age. Folks, I want to share something with you that may not strike your fancy at all. But God deals in seasons. And you got to know when the season changes. You've got to know that sometimes it's going to require you laying something down to move on with God's purpose. Sometimes it requires that. In Greenwood Village, I built a successful insurance agency. Wow. Everything was going good. Boy, I had the plaques on the wall. I had the ring on the finger. Something that they call in the industry the Super Bowl ring. And you start to add up all the accolades, you're doing pretty good. You think it's all, oh, it's going great. God says, I want you to go now to Bible college. I want to change your direction. See, you're finding your significance and who you are. Your identity is becoming this. And I need you to move this way. How many have experienced that in your life before? Where you had to give up something. Something that, you, that was, it, it was good. A lot of ministry happened through that agency all the time. I got to minister to a lot of people. God says, now it is time to move on. It's time to give that up. And so I did. And I remember when Nancy and I were going to step out in ministry. And I had two offers on the table. One in Houston to, you know, take over and pastor another church down there. It would have been very nice. Or come on staff of another existing church. And then I had this offer to do a church on East Colfax in a building. And I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he said, which is the least comfortable to you? I said, I know what I need to do. So I had to give answers to the two entities. And one of them said, you know what, we're going to support you through all of it. And they still support us financially to this day. And I want you to know that no matter what struggle you face, no matter what God calls you out to let go of, he already has determined and he knows what it costs. He wants to know where your heart is at. He wants to know, do your loyalties lie? Not so much that he doesn't know where you're at, but so that you would understand where you're at and that you would grow as you go. Amen? And that's the phenomenal part of it. We can sit back and we can say God has taken us through so many things and we can talk about so many unique things that God has done and the miracles that have happened and the transformed lives that we've seen. And we can look back, but during that time, sometimes it has cost us a lot. Amen? And we decided, yes, I am going to follow Jesus no matter what. In good times, in bad times. Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to say whatever it takes, Lord? Your words are truth. They are life. They are eternal. Where else would I go? 
I'm going to follow you no matter what if I have to lay down the very things that are so important to me right now. And I want you to know, folks, that it is worth it. I want you to know that it is incredible. It's the best journey that you can ever embark on. So if God is calling you out of comfort, embrace it. Decide that I'm willing to give that up. That cost, okay? In my mind it costs. It doesn't calculate. Just like when we give. And the, God's Word talks about tithing and giving and all those things. Nancy will tell you back in the day I told her write the tithe check before we do anything else. Right, Nancy? We're writing that. I don't know how we're doing this. I don't know how with what's left over how we're going to pay the rest. God always worked it out. Yep. He has always worked it out. He's always turned it around. He's always. It's always been the best plan, folks. It has always, God's promises are, let God's promises be true and every man a liar in comparison. Mm -hmm. Is what God's word tells us. And, but a total commitment to being a disciple is the focus. That's the cost. That I'm going to do this in this present age where it doesn't look so good. Where people are saying, oh, you know what? I'll just sit at my coffee table and have a cup of coffee and I'll watch church online. Folks, what if your church needs you? What if they need you to minister to someone in the church today? What if they, he's called you out of your comfort zone from behind the couch or sitting on the couch? Hopefully you're not behind the couch, <laughs> but you might be in front of the coffee table. But if you're cowering behind the couch, God is calling you out from behind the couch. And he's telling you it's time to minister. And Jesus says this, and don't be concerned about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Don't worry about it. Amen? Amen? Well, my Levi's don't fit anymore. Don't worry about it. <laughs> These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world, but your Father already knows your needs. Do you believe it? He knows your needs. How many times has He supplied our needs? I can't even count, right, Nancy? How many times? But it is an adventure, folks. It is an adventure beyond anything that you have experienced in your life, and it will continue to be an adventure that is just incredible. But He says these thoughts, they dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your Father already knows your needs. You're going to do the incredible as you step out in faith. And guess what? People are not going to like it because they ain't willing to do it. But they're going to watch what you're doing. Amen? They're going to see what you're doing. They're going to see that you're different. Your kids are going to see that you're different. Your cousins are going to see that you're different. In a few short weeks, I go to Rochester, New York and do my mother's memorial service. Folks, I am looking forward to it. God has prepared me for it. I was the worst person in the entire family. And yet he is going to use that to reach nieces and nephews. Some have been in prison themselves. He's going to use a person that they know was the worst of the worst. Paul says, I was chief among the sinners, but I ain't no more. Amen? Amen. I am not anymore. See, the difference is seeking the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And He will give you everything you need. Folks, He will open up extraordinary opportunities beyond your wildest comprehension. Jesus calls a tax collector in Matthew. Levi, he's sitting, also known as Matthew, at the tax collector's booth. 
He's robbing people blind. He's probably pocketing some of the money too. And Jesus says, follow me. He says, be my disciple. So Levi, he got up and he left everything to be Jesus' disciple. He left it all behind. He got up and he followed him. The worst of what the Jewish people thought was a sinner's. Oh, he exploited his own people. And I don't care what you came out of. Where you are right now, it does not matter. It matters where you're going when, when Jesus calls you that you change direction. You turn in the opposite direction and you follow him. Even if it does not make sense. Even if it costs you laying down something. You've got to be willing to count the cost to discover the purpose that he has for you. So let's review as we close. A true disciple will be more interested in the Word of God than the miracles, than the blessing. The things that prove it. Now they will happen along the way. The disciples left everything. You, you know, they left everything. But they've seen the miracles happen. They've seen every single one of them. They said, you know what? If we wrote down everything that Jesus had done, there would not be enough books that could be contained in the world Amen. at that time. Amen. And all the plans that He has for us. Amen? To live according to the Lord's purpose for your life is to be prepared to be uncomfortable in the immediate. As Jesus calls you out of your own life, old life, and know that following Jesus requires loyalty above any other that you would know. Above any earthly relationship, whether they turn on you or anything. You know what hurts most is the wounds of a friend. But yet we learn from them, don't we? Amen? The Lord gets mileage out of it all, folks. And in the end, you look back and you say, I'm so glad that I followed Jesus. Being Jesus' disciple requires a total commitment and a focus on what's important now in this present age. So what actions do you need to take? How do you stay focused? How do you follow Jesus? Think about the books of the Bible that were written. Think about Peter as he wrote his letters. Think about James, the brother of Jesus, that once didn't believe and wrote the book of James. You've got to read the Word of God and receive confirmation on His direction. If you don't read the Word of God, you won't receive the promise. So being on a daily basis, then something that Nancy and I have always done is we've always journaled, right? We've wrote down some things that he says for you can treasure them in the future. Remember it says about Mary when these things were spoken into her life, she treasured them. She had the, held them deeply in her heart. I mean, there was going to be times when she would see her son carry the cross. Pray and ask what you need to leave at the altar to pursue his purposes right now. Decide right now. God is showing people all over this room what you need to leave at the altar, what you need to leave behind. Continually we need to leave things behind in order to move forward. You know when people run a marathon, what they do is they start throwing all the clothes off and everything as they start out. You see water bottles flying and everything. you got to choose to run the race. Amen? No matter what the cost is, be willing also to leave everything when, God, when Jesus calls you out. And most importantly, sometimes it's our attitude, isn't it? It's what we hung to, on to. It's what we believed, and, and He challenges that belief in us. He challenges our identity and what we trust in and how we've seen ourselves. Even if it was false. Sometimes we got to lay down those things. Amen? Yeah. 
So let's pray. And then we'll worship together. Pray with me today and say, I'm ready to follow you, Jesus, into the life, the purpose, and the direction you choose. I trust you that you'll provide along the way in my future. I'll write down and treasure what you say in your promises. Thank you so much, Lord, for dying on the cross, for carrying that cross all the way to Calvary. I thank you that it didn't end there, that you rose from the dead just like you said. I trust in your promises. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's worship together as we call Messenger back up.
help really minister to you, Amen. and I think we really minister to the people today. And I want you to just soak in it for a minute.
Thank you. You know, when I think about those that have went before us, you know, uh, people faithful in music and art just went on to be with the Lord with heaven bound. And, and he used to worship with us all the time. We ministered together at Purpose Fest and in the parking lot on East Colfax. And, and he was a faithful brother. You could always call on him and say, hey, want to come out and do this? And even though he started living in San Luis Valley, I hit come all the way up out of San Luis Valley to join us for everything. And I remember a uh, uh, great job on the bass, brother. Yeah, but I remember John Martinez one time at New Beginnings playing the bass, playing with Blood Bob. He's went on to be with the Lord, served the Lord up to the end. Uh, you know, and I was able to talk to him, you know, towards the end by Facebook and things like that. And, we connected, but uh, faithful servants of God. And that's what we want to be, amen? amen? And thank you. Thank you guys for serving today. It was awesome. Thank you.